you know, someone told me a long time ago, a good friend who'd kind of been through this before, they were like, don't worry about the reviews, don't worry about, you know, what people say when they play the game, don't worry about social media, just really think about the journey. Far Cry is about as epic a blockbuster as it gets. Its history goes back years, with each title building upon the last. But what's special, I think, is that over time you can see all the elements that come together to form its DNA. Whether it's an open world where anything can happen, or a twisted antagonist that has just enough logic to what they're saying. Of insanity. Maybe most of all, the journey of someone trying to figure out not only how to survive in chaos, but ask the question, are we human or are we animals looking to be on top? For Far Cry 6, we want to take that history, all those elements, mix it together to create as epic a Far Cry as we can, but with characters who will bring you along for the ride of their own personal journey. And for us to be given a chance to lead on this project with so many different studios working together for the same goal, it's any creator's dream. I just sort of felt it right from the beginning that we had an opportunity to tell a story that was meaningful, not necessarily have it just be an FPS or just be a Far Cry game, but also um, absorb what's happening in the world around us. And, you know, we wanted to embolden the writers, embolden the creators to put as much of themselves uh, in the characters in the story as possible. And I think. It goes back to that, you know, first moment where it clicked that, you know, we're gonna tell a story about revolution. Castillo's got, what, 300,000 troops? I count six burnt out guerrillas, and you with a bullet to the leg. You can shoot, so shoot. I was actually uh, just wrapping up on Far Cry Primal and I was pulled into a room by our producer at the time. He basically said, do you want to work on Far Cry 6? And I was like, sure. Thought it would be a, another CODEV mandate maybe. He was like, as lead. I was like, oh, holy sh okay. The narrative director really is the person who is creating and maintaining the vision of the story for the game. So that means working with the writers, working with the other directors to make sure the vision of the game stays intact. To me it made sense because Ubisoft Toronto worked on several Far Cry games before. We were lucky to work on a Far Cry game, right? So everybody wants to work on a Far Cry game. We really honed our expertise here in Toronto. Combine that with a team that knows how to deliver amazing stories. You know, you're being given the reins of something that is so special, you know, to so many people. So you have to live up to those expectations and, you know, the expectations you've, you've set for yourself. So yeah, I was absolutely terrified, but you know, super excited at the same time. We want players to know that we're creating a blockbuster game for Far Cry 6, taking Far Cry to the next level from the moment you hit start. Far Cry 6 is a game built around one core theme, revolution. And considering our ship date falls almost to the day of the US election in November 2020, Wasn't expecting that laugh, all right. <laughs> the timing couldn't be more powerful for a game about igniting change. It's always a highlight uh, when you announce a game, when you announce this project you've been working on that people you know, are making rumors about and, and trying to guess what you're doing and, and coming up with stories like, oh, the next Far Cry is gonna be you know, this or that, and you're just sitting there like, oh, you're so wrong. <laughs> for a story to, I think, resonate and, and feel unique and, and meaningful, it has to be personal. And so that's how, we, that's how we started out. My family, 
They come from Iran. They fled Iran after the Iranian Revolution. Uh, so my parents uh, went over to uh, Sweden and England and, and had to start their life over. My aunt was murdered at the hands of the regime there that, that took over. So that kind of trauma, it's resonated with my family for so many years that when we landed on, okay, we want to do a revolutionary story on this you know, fictional island of Yara, former paradise, frozen in time, in the grip uh, of, of a revolution, it all just sort of comes out. My mother was from Colombia. She never met a fight she didn't pick. She was a revolutionary. When I came to Ubisoft, she went into palliative care. As she was in her failing health, she started to tell me more of things that she never told me, of traumas that she had. She told me about El Bogotazo, a revolution that inspired Fidel Castro, and Far Cry 6 is about revolution. This game became my love letter to her. I was born and raised in Buenos Aires, Argentina, during the mid-70s. In those years, there was bloody military dictatorship in the country. Even if I was a kid, I have memories of how the country sound at that time. I was taking bits and pieces of uh, my childhood memories, my long conversations with a group of exiles in Mexico and put everything in the cocktail thing and just spread it. So the day I got cast, it was exciting. Yeah, it's okay. Everything has a different purpose. So you're gonna tell me who you are? Whoa, what's in your back? I was a gamer. I knew about the franchise. So I was excited to, uh, to experience mocap and, and the video game world. But then it was the content and the political aspect of it and the opportunity to tell a story in a major platform as a Q1. Manuel's Afro-Cuban. He's from the island. He would make trips all the time. And so I started asking him questions of like, how do you feel about this? You know, does this capture sort of what would be an Afro-Yaran uh, perspective? And more and more, he started getting involved in the writing process to the point where we started sending him Excel sheets to verify all our dialogue. And then, you know, we were sending him art you know, in the game to make sure it felt truthful and authentic. And ultimately, we brought him on as a writer. So as a consultant working with a narrative team, I saw a lot of commonalities, like common places. It would like take me back to Cuba a lot. One of the main things that stayed with me, it was the Stalinist propaganda aspect of it. One of the sounds from my childhood I remember was probably the military marches that were very present everywhere. And those things kept reverberating in my head after all these years. South America, most countries, Argentina, Chile, Brazil, we've all gone to, through military dictatorships and we've all had uh, you know op oppression from from the government and we've grown up in yeah this paradise but at the same time there's violence and there's different so i think that all feeds feeds the process and it just makes sense <laughs> The sounds of military marches and the national anthem of Yara, those were all designated to different that different musicians. My job was to get inside the characters and give them soul and, and tell the story through through my music.
Far Cry 6 has basically three main themes. Uh, we have the, the Libertad theme that was originally done as a, a theme for the revolution. It came up on a ronroco, which is an instrument I use throughout the, the score, and it's a beautiful melody and it has that sense of melancholy, but it needed to be able to escalate and to represent what life in Yara is like right now. Performance? Well, our, our, this is really legitimate. What is the consequence of being like the revolution? Well, I think the first thing when it came to writing the characters, it really was, you know, a team effort. We had multiple writers on this project. Yeah. I mean, we've talked a lot about the heroes here, but what are they fighting against? Because. Mm. And these are the early explorations of Danny, you know, trying to land on, on sort of the perfect character, the perfect vehicle for you. A young revolutionary, you know, able to use anything at their disposal to fight back. What we did was we honed on the idea of, you know, Danny Rojas being this character that would want nothing to do with the revolution. And in a lot of ways, I think a lot of us would be that person. I keep my promises, Danny. You wanted a boat, you got a boat. It's a beautiful piece of sh but it'll get you to a Yankee beach, one with the naked fatties. You two are just gonna let me leave? Bullshit. To me, anyway, it made a lot of sense. I also drew from my own family, who a lot of them they ran uh, from the persecution that was happening. I feel like Danny is like my mother. My mother came to Canada, no family here, but she had to find her way. Same with Danny. Clara Garcia, who is the, the leader of Libertad, really sort of embodies the ideal, the person that you, you kind of strive to be. And she really looks at the revolution in a, in a very simple way, intentionally. Free elections, free expression, free the outcasts. Ayara free of Castillo's, simple. I watched Castillo order a whole boat of our people shot to death. Get as far away as you can from that psychopath. psychopath. All, All of you. you. A revolution is not won by the fearless. It's won by the fear. That was really important, was to have her as an anchor. Order a whole boat of our people. And to have the character of Danny to be sort of striving for that, even if they didn't realize it. And then the counterpoint, obviously, is, you know, Anton Castillo. So the Far Cry 6 team had been going back and forth on potential actors that, you know, would be the best candidate for this new villain. You know, the villain had become quite iconic in, you know, the Far Cry universe. Casting, you know, the big bad with any Far Cry is one of the most difficult things to do. And what was important about Anton was also making sure that this is a character that you could be swayed by. And that's really what makes a, a Far Cry villain a Far Cry villain. You know, I even hesitate using the word villain. Everyone wants to say villain, it drives me crazy. It's an antagonist. It's someone with an opposite, you know, point of view. Been a long way. Um, something big happened yesterday, and the first instinct was let's tell the TV as soon as possible. So it's time to talk to Anton. You deserve it, and we, as lions, do what we must do to survive. We cull the herd. We are done carrying the weak. When we started to move to Anton being Afro-Yaran uh, as well, 
Then we started to really lean into someone like Giancarlo. Uh, he could bring that sort of gravitas and speak to Anton as a father and also bring uh, a perspective of, of someone who's a person of color. Yeah, I love it. I really love the color. Wow. Do you remember the trailer? Yes. The details are fantastic. And you work such details into the eyes, too, because I see the strength, but I see it fading, but I also see the question mark. <laughs> You're almost there. <laughs> yeah, very impressed. Really very impressed. All right. Fantastic. Ooh, Justin, thank you. thank you for your work. In a lot of ways, Anton, Clara, Danny, for me, they formed this triangle of personality that you're constantly uh, pinging between. And that just gives you depth. That gives you depth of character. And so all of that stuff is great on paper. You know, it's great when you're in the room and you're dreaming this stuff up. But I like to say, uh, you know, it's not real until it comes out of the actor's mouth. Have you done this stuff? No, never. Narratively, in terms of characters and story, I think the team did an amazing job. We have really uh, lovely characters, complex, and not only the villain, but also like uh, Danny. It's something really that we wanted to have in Far Cry 6, like a, a real uh, character that speaks, that has emotion, and, and I think we can feel that in the game. When I first saw you, I wanted to gut you like a crocodile, but you're more dead or now, Danny. Gracias. The characters are from the country. The characters are from Yara. They know the culture, they know the people, which I think is a really, a really great move. And, and it's not just happening at Far Cry. Like it's diversity and inclusion and, and representation are growing more and more. The ability to choose a male or a female Danny and both characters are just as strong. They go my name wrong. wrong. I think it's really important that people get the option between a male and female character because at the end of the day, it, it represents different things for different people. And by giving people that choice, it, it shows that we're not just having the conversation, but we're actually doing something to change it. What's it been like to play the same character? Would you like to answer first? Would you like to answer first? Just like that. <laughs> this is that's like the perfect example of how it's been. Yeah. Some of the things I'm most proud of on this project are, are not even level design related. I spend some time working with the narrative team talking about character representation uh, because they have a trans character that, and uh, they really wanted to um, like make sure they had an earnest representation. They, and so they talked to me among other people, like they didn't just find like the one trans person they could like, you come and help us do this. They, they, they were really intentional about it. So we had some conversations about like the character's motivations and what they would be dealing with. When Papa found out I turned from his favorite daughter into a freak, his words. Just trans in the military, compai. I was lucky. Talia caught me trying to steal her gear, but instead of turning me in, she gave me a deck. Seeing a bit, bit of myself reflected in there, as well as just having positive representation in a game. Especially for me is, is probably one of the biggest biggest marks of pride <laughs> to, to have to have some of that going on. While we were recording the trios of Cuban music, the mixer, I recall that was back in January, beginning of February, he said, there's a strange pneumonia that I think is going to hit us at some point. When I first heard about it, it was uh, when uh, we heard about it from our partners in Ubisoft Shanghai. So we were in the middle of production and COVID absolutely came out of nowhere. I remember, 
you know, hearing whispers about it and it's like, okay, this seems a little scary, but we never could have anticipated the effect it was going to have. I was on set when, when COVID first started, I was filming, I think it was with Giancarlo. I think that was the time he was on set too. We were filming kind of like the, the last section of the game. I was actually on my way to Calgary to another uh, set, like in the car, we all heard that Tom Hanks got it. Yes, I remember that. Yeah. And that's when everybody, it felt that that's when actually it's just like, oh shit, this is real. If Tom Hanks has it, all of us will get it. One of the memorable COVID moments we have in production is when we brought Gabilonia to Canada, to Toronto. Gabilonia is the singing character of Talia. Falla, porque en la calle se dice que viene batalla. No tenemos miedo, mi gente no falla. Tú sabes que seguimos dando la talla. Hey, canalla, somos los yaranos. Tú sabes que no se desmaya. Pasa la raya. Y pero es un pueblo que arde metiendo la galla. Yo me tralla. It uh, was pretty complicated to bring someone from Venezuela, from Caracas, into the country. When we finally achieved that, it was March 12th. We supposedly have three days of work hesitation and doubts, the message from the government wasn't clear at that point what was going on. All the rumors about, okay, there's no more flies coming in or out Canada, we are sealing the borders and everything. The people from casting approach it to me and say, we won't be able to do everything we need to do with Gabilonia. We give you one day and we need to send her back. So it's now or never. You say, okay, vamos a echarlo, let's do it. So in the same day we did the rehearsal, we did mock-up, we recorded two songs. She did also an interview for marketing. It was a quite hectic day, but, but she did it. She got the payment here and fly to Cuba. She was stranded in Cuba until she found a way to get in a humanitarian flight of doctors from Cuba to Venezuela. <laughs> It accelerated so fast that the last day of shooting with Giancarlo was the Friday. They shut down the studio on the Tuesday. So it hit us hard. There were so many questions of what are we gonna do now? Uh, because we still had another shoot coming. We still had voice recordings with our actors. You know, how are you gonna do mocap with an actor who's in LA that can't fly? It was a scary time. Are we gonna be able to finish this thing? So this is Nav, uh, I'm at the studio. Uh, it's about three weeks into COVID and they gave us a window to pick up some of our stuff. So I'm coming to grab some things. Totally empty. And we're all keeping our distance, working from home. Here's the narrative area. And surprise, we have Nuha, one of our narrative designers. She's looting my right now. She's looting her <laughs> She's being careful. She's got her gloves right. Got her mask. Oh yeah, the biggest mask ever. Take a little walk. This is the director's area. So people have rated their things. I am rating my keyboard and webcam and all those little 
and the work from home things. And as you can see, it is so creepy empty. I will tell you, I can't wait for everyone to come back so we can finish this thing. So there's your tour. Pretty crazy, huh? And I was like, we're never gonna make it. It's like we're, I don't know, 800 people across the world working on this project and everybody's home. We didn't have the tools at that, at that time. Like, how are we gonna do it? It's, it's, it's super hard. One of the hardest things about being in a crisis is the unknown and not knowing, you know, um, how to anticipate what's coming. And I think with COVID, it was probably, you know, one of the biggest, most unprecedented situations that the world had ever faced. And, and so, you know, we needed to think fast and work quickly to make sure that the teams were well supported. Suddenly you're at home. You know, there's no separation between work and your living room. I'd cleared out my dining table. Working on a AAA game in the time of COVID stopped our ability to have cross-pollination between the different areas, which I really miss. Honestly, they all bled together. All the days started to blend because it was I was working from home and I wasn't seeing people. How can we continue when you have a game this big, it's, it's too big to fail, so you need to find alternatives, ways to circumvent things, even if they are as bad and terrible as a global pandemic. The way that I would try and focus is really take moments where I would just shut everything down, you know, silence everything, every conversation, every, oh. So yes, yeah, so the other thing at COVID is you got to meet everyone's pets every three seconds, including mine. And so a typical uh, meeting was me doing this constantly with the cats and you're just gonna stay up there. Then I'm gonna bring you, bring you down. Oh my God, he's huge. Very cute. Yeah. <laughs> Not happy with that at all. Interestingly enough, I think being home and not being in the office, not being pulled in a hundred different directions, allowed me to focus on, on writing. Danny meets Clara. Uh, Rich, if you could do Julio. And Jordan, thank you very much for this, uh, if you could do Clara. We needed to reevaluate how we do meetings, how we do reviews, yeah, how we work, basically. There were a lot of challenges, like it was, it, you know, it was learning, learning a new skill. Like my first day as a level designer was uh, the first day of the pandemic, like the first day we worked from home. So I had started a new job working at home. I had no, like, no experience in that role before, so I had to learn it remotely. I, so I can record my screen. So this is my desk. <laughs> I've got all my notebooks. I've got our, our Far Cry 6 mouse pad that you can now see how dirty my life is. Yeah, this is my work setup. Like, it's, <laughs> I feel naked. <laughs> um, it, yeah, it just it took a lot of time to kind of adjust to being in this space every day by myself. Um, got a nice monitor, though. COVID played a big role, the, the way I perceived those sounds during isolation. Working in the studio, uh, you make breaks, you talk to a friend, you have a walk. Working from my bedroom, and listening 
machine guns, explosion, grenades, uh, and not having anywhere to go, uh, that created an additional mental burden. I want to get outside, I want to get out of here. Go to a quiet place. So I think the thing with COVID is, you know, it opened my eyes to the capacity we all have uh, to understand each other, to, to work with each other, to support each other. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Paul. Yeah. And George. Uh, that was clear, though. That was, that was like that was <laughs> so. I good. saw what you meant. It took some time, but at some point, like you know, it clicked, and we were like back to our normal productivity. You know. And it felt amazing. And now, like, we know how to work from home now. One of the other things that was great was that, you know, we got more time. And that was to make sure we were all shipping healthily and we, we had the time we needed to finish. Some people were able to work better. We discovered different ways to handle things. That has really brought a sense of solidarity in the team because we have to keep on keeping on. There's concerns, there's things that can go wrong, but f it, we gotta get it done. Now we're fucking talking. All right. Hey everyone, I'm really, really excited to do our first uh, uh, team meeting since uh, since uh, we're work we've been working from home. So I think we have right now like 700 people uh, connected from all studios, so Shanghai, Montreal, Toronto, Kiev, and Berlin. Uh, we went from 4,000 people in Montreal uh, working in the office to 4,000 people working from home. So here's, uh, here is the Kiev update. So greetings from uh, sunny Berlin. Hello everyone, uh, this is the greeting from Shanghai team. And uh, as you might know that uh, Shanghai team has already passed the, the working from home status. So I think one of the big differences of, of how we approached production on Far Cry 6 was that we had more of a council at the top, uh, you know, in terms of direction. Because it was a very unique situation, we were also able to have the support of someone like Dan Hay, who's the executive producer of the brand, was the creative director of, of Far Cry 5, who was super supportive as well. I always, um, and still do, have seen Dan as a bit of a mentor. Within the teams themselves, there was a real determination. We're just going to do this, and we're going to make it amazing. And man, when we came back to shoot, that was an experience because we shot right in the heart of COVID, just, just over there. Limited on set, you know, so you had only a few people allowed uh, on the mocap stage. Uh, you'd have to keep distance, so six feet. Imagine how do you shoot a scene when you have four people talking to each other. It was madness, um, but we got through it. We had an amazing, amazing team. So five minutes ago, we called our official uh, rap on Petra Cinematic. Yeah. 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 Cheers. you guys. been five years to get to this day. Uh, I've been thinking a lot this week, all the way back to, there's a server room over there where 10 of us were sitting. It was very sweaty. Stephanie, you might've been there as well. <laughs> and uh, to get to hundreds of people around the world uh, working on this thing. We're gonna look at some reviews. I think the main thing is keep it zen. <laughs> 
<laughs> the most important thing, I think, is to remember the bonds we created with each other through this thing. That's what you'll remember. I kind of want to see what you Far Cry 6 is without a doubt Ubisoft's most ambitious entry into the series. Far Cry 6 is a non-stop thrill ride from start to finish, delivering a wide variety of activities to pursue within its guts. I kind of like Summarize. Uh, Far Cry 6 is the perfect definition of, of what a new game on an established uh, saga should do. five-year journey that we're, we've been on. It's really special. Just seeing how many people tried really hard to make this a great game. Is it perfect? No. <laughs> we know that. We're not idiots. <laughs> I have to say that this was the best project probably of my life, you know, in 30 years of making audio. And here's to shipping Far Cry 6. You know how hard these folks have worked, and you know how much of themselves they've put into this. Through COVID, through everything, and to just hear them laugh, you know, was... Uh, like to just hear them laugh and have a good time and not think about all the stress and, and issues that are kind of facing them every day. Um, I'll cherish that uh, forever, to be honest. Doesn't matter what happens with the game, how well it does. Like that was, uh, it was just amazing to be a part of. <laughs> you got me to cry. <laughs> Damn it. De lograr libertad, nuestra yara unida en paz.